Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted to welcome a very, very senior corporate professional from Singapore, Mr. Sandeep Bhargav. Sandeep, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ashutosh. Um, Sandeep is the Managing Director, Asia Pacific and Japan of Rackspace Technology. He's earlier, he was earlier with Hewlett-Packard, DXC Technology and PNG. So Sandeep, before we start uh, talking about technology, tell me about your own journey in brief. Yeah, so you know, I've been, I was born and brought up in Delhi mm-hmm. um, to middle class parents. My father was a lecturer at Ramjas College, so we had a pretty educational background. Mm-hmm. Uh, but seeing his travels, I was pretty sure that uh, scientist, being a scientist in India was not one of the professions I wanted to get into. Uh-huh. Uh, and, you know, uh, I did engineering MBA uh, and through that, joined a firm. Uh, and I got into tech by mistake. I actually uh-huh. wanted to sell soaps. Okay. Uh, wanted to get into hardcore selling. Uh, and I landed up in tech, mm. uh, worked for PNG, like the company, joined with them, remained with them, liked what I was doing. And slowly over a period of time, you know, the, the dot com happened, the bust happened, and then all of that. Uh, what really enticed me was how technology had the potential to change mm. customers' lives. And I was always B two B, right? So, right. Uh, and I always liked staying with the customer for a longer duration. Right? Mm-hmm. See them, you know, selling them, shaping their thinking, selling them the technology, seeing them use the technology, get benefits of it, mm. face struggles, right? Uh, and through all of that is when you form really strong relationships, mm-hmm. like when you've gone through the ups and downs. Sure. Uh, and I've seen technology evolve and its impact evolve on businesses. Mm-hmm. You know? And we've yeah. seen a whole lot of unicorns evolve Wonderful. just because technology has gone to a different level. Altogether. Well said. And uh, moving now to Rackspace technology, uh, tell me a little bit about this venture and what are some of the areas of your focus so we we started mid nineties. Uh, we started as a web hosting company for mid market commercial firms, mm-hmm. like people who wanted to get started, uh, wanted to have a website, wanted to have hosting, uh, compute, email, mm-hmm. like but just didn't have the resources of a larger organization. Mm-hmm. So we started with that. Uh, we l- launched world's first public cloud platform using OpenStack technologies. Okay. <laughs> and then slowly other technologies emerged like Azure, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Google. And we you know, started partnering with them. Um, and so now we've become this uh, multi-cloud company mm-hmm. that, that helps customers get to the right compute platform, mm-hmm. uh, you know, get to it, help them uh, use cloud native technologies, help them, you know, get the best out of it. Mm. So continuous uh, management, uh, secure them, mm. you know, get make sense of their data. Yeah. So that's that's the company we are in. And we are like pure play cloud company. We don't distract ourselves with implementing softwares or mm. you know, a whole bunch of other lines. Wonderful. And, uh, you know, cloud has been talked about for the last one and a half decades. Uh, and yet there are many companies who are still, it's a small companies, who are still sitting um, on their computer hard drive. What are some of the advantages that the medium and small enterprises can take of uh, the moving to the cloud completely? Yeah, and you know, uh, it's interesting. I've I've been in Asia uh, for a fairly long time. And I would say Southeast Asia, India, and China have very fairly similar business dynamics. Mm. Right? Um, you know, a data center is considered an asset. Uh, you know, it's a building, it's equipment, people can touch and feel them. They feel mm. proud about it. They've created something, right? Mm. But I think COVID taught everybody that, you know, when electricity went off or when UPSs went off or when a server went off, you just couldn't even get to your data centers. You know, your entire business continuity was at a threat just because the data center was at a place that nobody could go to, mm. right? And so it has been a mind shift change you know some of the people that i've talked to over the last five seven eight years mm-hmm. i've seen them adopt to cloud uh, much more vigorously um, mm-hmm. but again you know the tendency remains uh, 
that my asset is my asset. I can, if I can see and touch and feel it, it's, you know. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, however, you know, um, like I'll give you an example from my own days. Like I started, you know, very early on as a SAP consultant. Mm. And when we plan a new implementation, we would plan 120 days out mm. because it would take 90 days to get a network pipe in and it would take you know, six thirty to sixty days to get the hardware in, and then all the implementations and so on, right? So our plan was like first one twenty days is we would do all the testing, uh, because it would take us that much amount of time to get mm. the Today you can just go to cloud and spin up an environment in eight hours mm. and be ready. And one twenty days has got reduced to eight hours. Wow. Right? Uh, so the ability and and on cloud a lot of software has have emerged who have started offering things as a service mm -hmm. right and so from a tech department perspective it has become so easy to plug and play technologies mm. uh, and to get to a business outcome that they wanted to get to fairly quickly right mm. in a matter of hours and a matter of days versus you know the months that we were used to right and the other other example that i give to people is and this is really true for enterprises like one cio has said to me you know, he said, Sandeep, you know, my CIO looks, my CEO and the board looks at me and says, you want change windows, you want downtime. Hey, I use WhatsApp, I use Facebook. I can call all my customers on WhatsApp. It's mm -hmm. free and it's available 24-7. Yeah. And my corporate networks, my Gmail, I can send things on Gmail and it's free. And I'm paying all this money on collaboration suite and email and all mm -hmm. of that. And you don't time of four hours, like every three months or every yeah. six months, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the use of technology has become pervasive mm. across the whole business spectrum, right? Mm. Uh, I remember when I first started, a managing director would take an email printout, write on it, and then a secretary would go and respond, type a response back, right? Uh, to like everybody now like uses an email, right? But regardless of what spectrum you are in. That's it. So that impact has meant that everybody, the business owners, the mid-level managers, the younger talent, they all are using technology. Mm. And so the adoption becomes much faster. And if you still struggle, then the problem is, is how do you attract talent? Because nobody wants to work in a company where you might be using outdated software. Very interesting. Um, on a more now general scale, I mean, as a, as a global technology leader, and you said you've been uh, part of this from the mid-90s, I'd love to get your perspective on what goes into building a global technology company. Uh, interesting, right? Um, you know, we like the world that we grew up in, mm -hmm. uh, most of the innovation actually happened in the West and Correct. specifically in the Americas, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the company I'm in right now, you know, I run the Asia Pacific operations. Though I'm now going into a global role where I will manage all our product offerings, pre-sales and delivery globally for the mm -hmm. company, still based out of Singapore. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, it was, you created products, the market was ripe for trying it out. Mm -hmm. And once you had enough of a base, whether it was B2B or B2C, mm -hmm. you then went to the other Western worlds, which was really UK. And then after UK, you went to Australia. Mm -hmm. And then people in Singapore... And Hong Kong would pick it up and then and then slowly it would make its way to India, right? Mm -hmm. But the technicians doing all of this back end work from late nineties till now were probably in India. Mm -hmm. Like there were a lot of people in Bangalore or elsewhere who would have known about the product because they were building it. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just that it was not available. And what has happened now is if you look at the pace act of innovation, the pace of uh, newer software is getting built and deployed in market. Mm. Uh, India, Indonesia, they've all kind of caught up. They have all kind of started building things for their own populations, right? Uh, in that sense, the, the technology have become much more pervasive. People have become much more attuned to what's happening in all parts of the world, right? Mm. Where it was just US centric and then, you know, the outliers. Now, even people in US know what's your competitor in India doing or what's your competitor in Indonesia doing, mm. right? And when, and of, but of course still, you know, US has tremendous advantage right, of scale. Uh, but when that happens, you know, 
a technology company can truly become global mm. by embracing talent from a whole range of countries mm. and positioning people in a whole range of places and not just like in a single office somewhere right and that has been important because you know it's pandemic anyways all of us have kind of drifted apart mm. Um, mm. and there's no single office anymore and if there's no single office anymore then why should it limit you to get talent anywhere right and that's what i think is a hallmark of building a true a company that can have global scale and ambition mm. and really scale and the other thing i would say is is really the networks that have evolved like right? the investors um, you know the matchmakers like they have evolved to be like from all parts of the world mm-hmm. like singapore is fashioning itself you look at the private equity money that is going yeah. in india like you know the chinese money you know with jack ma and all that was flowing in other parts of the world mm-hmm. and that has meant that whatever you do you have a global outlook because your money and your stakeholders are coming from all over the world well said bringing in the best ideas mm-hmm. right uh, yeah so Very the well world said. is right for that right Very well said. And your response, uh, Sandeep, gives me a uh, segue to my next question. And I've often been asked this myself, and who better to ask the same question? Uh, what is behind Indians like yourselves leading so many global technology companies around the world? You know, I've thought about it myself, and mm-hmm. quite candidly, you know we all worry about whether our kids will have the same hunger right uh you know we came we grew up in a era of scarcity correct right mm-hmm. like we got our a landline phone after 10 years right? <laughs> yes right uh, and that scarcity meant that we were really hungry for you know what about the opportunity that was thrown at us mm-hmm. how could we grab and then you know we went to talk schools or colleges not because you know we wanted to be an engineer mm-hmm. but we wanted to be amongst that elite right okay. uh, and it is the networks um, and the pedagogy that taught us more in mm-hmm. those institutions right mm-hmm. as we came out in the world we wanted to make a mark right we were always putting a hand out uh, uh, you know there's i'm going to talk be talking to some students in a polytechnic in singapore mm-hmm. and this is one of the questions what can we do to get promoted and and you know when i look at the generation which has come in in a era of plenty and that spans across mm. races across mm. cultures across sure. countries right mm. uh sometimes that hunger is missing right mm. uh even today i would put up my hand and say hey i can do it and you know somewhere you also have to have the confidence mm. and i think india gave us the era that we were growing up gave us that confidence that hey we can succeed Mm. I will put up my hand and then I will figure out how do I do it. Correct. Mm. But is in a lot of other cultures I see that a little bit of that risk averseness. Mm. Right? I would not put up my hand unless I'm really sure I can do it. Correct. Right? And then of course you have the the US on the other side where you will put up your hand for anything and everything, right? Mm. And take this can fail. I don't think that we were there that you know fail was as celebrated in the generation we grew up in mm. but definitely risk taking boss like and, you know putting up your hand and wanting to do more mm. in an in a way that engin- and then engendered loyalty in the company like we were working within the bounds of the company correct right we were not working to go to our own startup or mm. you know we were staying within that bounds and as we stayed within those bounds and we showed that loyalty and that selflessness to promote the company forward mm. i think a lot of indians kind of succeeded in that corporate setup right great response yeah and what would you say that is the same is true for entrepreneurs i think entrepreneurs need to break eggs right yeah. which is where the americans are really good at and mm. indians have really learned right with all the entrepreneurs it was slightly different from the era that we were coming mm. but breaking eggs and failing in our generation would have been you know people would have looked at it and say like what are what is your kid doing <laughs> yes well so great response right. great response and uh, you know you also spoke a little bit about the pandemic 
uh, I'd love to get your perspective on what are some of the opportunities the pandemic has thrown up for the digital economy. Oh, actually quite a bit. If you just look at, in India, if you look at all the food delivery apps, mm. right? Um, it's just it's just created that entire ecosystem. Mm. Uh, I mean, you could argue that we would have gotten there in five years, right? But we have got there during the pandemic. Mm. In Singapore, where everybody eats out, so that culture of having food courts mm. right next to apartment clusters. So there's you are never more than 100 meters away from an eatery, which is going to be really cheap, mm. right? And it's affordable. Yeah. They, you know, delivery has just picked up. Like now, more and more Singaporeans are delivering food. Mm. And you know, like Singapore is such a small city, okay. right? People are not even willing to walk 200 meters to get their food. Mm. Uh, so you see in a whole range of things, like education is another, right? Uh, I remember five years ago, one of my friends was in, uh, an entrepreneur in this area and he said, mm. people have tried digital apart from Imran Khan who had like put everything online. Mm. Nobody has been really successful, right? Mm. And even he did not make money out of it. And then you see all the edutech startups now, right? And they are unicorns. Five years ago, who would have thought that digital education was going to be a thing? Correct. Uh, and it trans, it is, you know, it runs across boundaries, mm -hmm. right? Like my son took tuition from teachers in India. You know, we were careful about the accent. Right? Um, but hey, like for a year in mm -hmm. his class 10, he was learning from teachers in India uh, mm -hmm. through Zoom. Uh, so it's just... It's just not like, you know, you have the chance to create new of new softwares, new products. Mm. But in a whole range of businesses across, it has transformed, mm. right? It has given many more teachers an avenue to connect with students, mm. right? It has given avenue for tarot card readers or Jyotish. Like I have like somebody reached out to me saying, we do this, we read your Kundli and we can do it for your corporate and we'll give you a corporate discount. Like, who would have thought that where's the, where was the platform, right? Amazing. So, so people have found different ways of that hyper-connected world we are living in mm -hmm. to create different models. Very interesting. Uh, moving on now, uh, Sandeep, uh, given the fact, and again, you spoke about how, you know, we are in multiple offices, or may, there's no, no concept of a one office left. If you, as the leader of uh, a tech company, were to build a team in the current circumstances, which is partly work from home, partly work from uh, office and so on and so forth. What would you look for in the people you bring on board? Uh, you know, I've, um, I've worked 20 plus years in a hybrid model, because mm -hmm. p was one of the first companies to adopt it. Mm -hmm. uh, they transformed the C-suite they took pictures of it. They showed all the C-level people were sitting in open offices. Mm -hmm. And they said to the whole world, why do you need a cabin, mm -hmm. right? Or a cubicle. They designed the whole build, uh, you know, the whole setup for people to work only three or four days from office, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but they also set up guard boards. And, and that has a, and that, this was done like late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. So imagine, right? Mm -hmm. And as I would bring the team, I would, I would really apply some of those old fashioned principles, mm. right? Uh, and they are really, when you are bringing the team, especially like the really young members who are mm. young in the journey, mm. you have to care and treat them. The way you treat them is different. Mm. How do you do that? Right? Um, then there are young members in the organization, but they are fairly experienced. Mm. But how do you make sure that they understand the cult company's culture and ethos, right? Mm. Um, so if I had a way, I would actually build an organization where you can work from anywhere. I would look at areas where collaboration is really key. And I would really collate, collocate them and say, hey, all of you really need to come to work, mm -hmm. right? You can decide how many days, but I'm going to hire in this part of the, the city. And you need to be able to travel, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you need to be able to get three, four days a week, whatever that is, right? I would invest in the ways we collaborate with each other and mm. collaborate is not just Zoom or Teams or, you know, yeah. it is 
just making sure that we have a pulse of the organization, right? I'm not sure if I would put in a productivity measuring software, mm -hmm. uh, though I might debate a little bit about it, uh, mm -hmm. just to make sure people are not moonlight, yeah. right? Uh, and then I would really, you know, if my workforce is millennials, I would really look to them and how they learn. Mm -hmm. you know? One of the things like I was in a forum where I said, look, when we were growing up, we came to office, we learned from our bosses, like mm -hmm. how they spoke, how they positioned things, what kind of shoes and, you know, what are the attire was like we learned yeah. about brands from them right mm -hmm. and and somebody of similar age as me and said just look at your kids mm -hmm. do they really learn from you? they learn from youtube mm -hmm. right which is very true when you look at the younger crowd that is coming in mm -hmm. the way they learn has really evolved mm -hmm. they're not really learning from seeing maybe they are a little bit but they're learning from seeing social media mm -hmm. right and how would you use that to enable that they learn more about the company quicker. How interesting. Right. How interesting. And my last question, you, Sandeep, and this is for the many, many people who will listen to our conversation. Based on your own incredible journey and also being at the cutting edge of technology, focusing on the cloud, what would you say are three lessons you would want our viewers and listeners to take away from your own journey and from our conversation? The first lesson I would say is, is um, never give up your dreams, mm -hmm. right? Um, and never stop backing yourself. Uh, you know, if you stay at what you wanted to do, mm -hmm. if you knock enough number of times, you would, mm -hmm. right? Um, I've seen in my MBA batches, there were people who, want, who had a desired job. They wanted mm -hmm. to do something. They wanted to get into consulting couldn't get through for a variety of reasons, kept knocking and ultimately did go, right? Did mm -hmm. get into that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so if you really wanted to do something, don't be disheartened that at the first or the second or yeah. the third attempt. Now, of course, you know, if you wanted to get in, into the Indian Army and you have a physical defect, mm -hmm. you know, it's not going to happen. So. Sure. But there are other ways, like maybe you could do cybersecurity and Correct. get through that, right? Mm -hmm. So never give up on on your dreams. Mm -hmm. right? Second, I would say, sometimes those dreams can also be childish. Mm -hmm. So also remain very, very agile. Right. Right. Like I always wanted to be in sales. Right. And then, and the first chance I could get in, I got into sales and I realized I actually did not like sales. I mm -hmm. really liked to work with customers over a longer period and see them adopt technology, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. see the fruits of labor, mm -hmm. which is more, account management than sales, right? Where, yeah. where you touch and go, you touch and go, right? Uh, so you have to be agile. Like one of our friends wanted to be in consulting and after three years decided it was not for him. Mm. Even though he did another MBA for it, mm. right? But he kind of gave it up because it was too much travel. So mm. remain agile. Mm. Like don't get buried and don't think it's... And the third thing I would say is, is mm. just continue to network, continue to meet people. Mm -hmm. uh, Continue to meet people from a professional perspective, not because you are looking for a job, mm. but because you are genuinely interested in human interactions and learning from others and understanding how different industries are evolving. Mm. Right? Um, continue to have conversations. Uh, continue to put up your hand in your current organization and, and say to people, hey, mm. I'm ready. Continue to reach out to your past mentors and continue to tell them how you evolved in your journey. Mm. Because you don't know and all of that will create an opportunity that will knock on your door mm. and will take you in a different direction. How amazing. Right? How amazing. And on that note, Sandeep and your three amazing lessons, never give up your dreams, keep going, remain agile uh, and continue to network and constantly meet people and keep putting up your own hand. Thank you so much for speaking to me. Thank you for talking to me about your incredible journey. Thank you for talking about rank space technology, about your thoughts on the digital economy, and uh, about a lot of great stuff that you are doing. Thank you again for speaking to me and good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast. 
a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.